And so welcome everyone to this Toast conversation. We're here today for an hour with Marlene Nogawa. Marlene, thank you so much for hosting today this conversation on belonging. And I'm Alex Arnold. I'm the executive consultant at the Taos Institute. And I'm very excited for this time together. It will be recorded um, and we can just get started. So thank you again, Marlene, for taking it from here. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, so welcome, everyone. I'm Marlene Ogawa. And um, Alex and I agree that I was going to speak on a book that um, that reflects a bit of a journey of one of my friends, colleagues, and what she's written. It's called On Belonging, Finding Connection in an Age of Isolation. So as you come into the space, um, those who've just joined, I'm going to paste into the chat again, just where you are calling from and what's the best thing that has happened to you thus far today. And it will give us a sense of the time and where you are at. Um, and if you want to unmute and share a little bit. So I'm curious, um, Kelsey, where are you traveling to? Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my friend who lives in Vermont, um, and I live in California, and we're going to go to Atlanta together. Nice, nice. Well, I've been to Vermont, haven't been to Atlanta. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Chrissy. Do you know why your dog didn't bark today? What's happening? Uh, persistent training, a lot of patience. She's getting there, but today we had a whole walk and she didn't bark at anyone or anything. So amazing. <laughs> great, great. It's like the mini moments pay off eventually, huh? The work. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Welcome everyone. So those who just joined, share in the chat. Um, Chakri, and please correct me um, how I say your name. Yeah. What's what's the big question that you have about the book? Um, and I'm curious who you discussed it with. So if you can share a little bit. Yeah. Well, so um, I think uh, the last three years has been a uh, journey into belonging uh figuring out my place in the world and it's definitely not in india um so i have a, a clinical therapist friend uh, who's uh, who was very active in, uh, in the 80s as well and we keep discussing about how um things have been changing or not changing in south africa and how that's not different from anywhere else in the world. And so um, peeking into the book um, gave me a chance to pick on our brain a little bit more. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Chakri. Yeah, it's so interesting about belonging and identity. So I'll start and what I'm going to do is frame some of the conversation and a bit of the journey in terms of where um, our cut lens around belonging. And then in between, I'm going to pause and just um, uh, for reflection and, and questions. Um, <clears throat> so the book on belonging is written by Kim Samuel. And as I mentioned, it's been a um, a journey of the work that we've been doing as a collective around understanding isolation and connectedness and what builds connectedness in different systems of being and in, in the world that we are in. And so with that, um, a lot of lessons along the way, a lot of processes to understand. So what is belonging and, and what does it mean? And then how we connect and how do we Systems of belonging. So this is the book um, um, on belonging, finding connection in an age of isolation, um, written by Kim Samuel. And Kim Samuel um, 
she's Canadian, um, but works across the world around understanding um, isolation and connectedness. And she speaks about isolation as sitting at the bottom of the well. And what is what are our moments of sitting at the bottom of a well? And how do we um, bring ourselves out, find community support to, 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 to move from the better, bottom of the well? And sometimes what is the gift of being in that moment? And how do we dig into our resilience? <clears throat> so over time, the work has also allowed us to work on definitions and understanding of isolation. And when we speak about isolation and not having a sense of belonging, it's really when it's chronic um, and when you have inadequate quality and quantity of relationships, um, really the relationships that that helps you to be resilient. Um, and, and Often it's also your ability when you're not able to approach people, not able to have meaningful relationships. And some of our work reflected on, so where does this come from for us as individuals and collectives and what does it mean? And how do we shift from um, and, and move towards engaging emotionally and physically? Um, um, and, and so when we started this work and my work is very much found on addressing social injustice, issues around poverty, um, vulnerability in communities, and at the time also working with different partners on the dimensions of poverty. And so typically measurement around poverty has been around kind of uh, material wealth uh, and those dimensions. But with that came a lot of lessons and, and which was found by economists in conversations around poverty and measurements and from the voices of the poor and households where people were saying, I'm poor, but I have these relationships and these connections and they help me and I stay resilient. Um, and, and, and financial poverty doesn't mean uh, emotional poverty more often than not. So trying to understand and advocating for better measurement, better understanding of well-being, what does well-being look like and, and how do we look at um, well-being as, as a whole. So there have been a lot of studies around isolation, loneliness, um, a sense of disconnect, and it's both how we perceive it and how we experience it. Um, and there's a lot of studies, the initial studies in a lot of countries have been about older people and older people, people being isolated and what that means. But of late we found, and there's really a groundswell around the work around understanding um, uh, loneliness and chronic loneliness and, and the impact they have. So when I say loneliness, isolation, uh, um, disconnection, it's it's really kind of I'm using it intertwined and I'm clubbing it all together. Um, but what a lot of the studies also look at what's the emotional, physical, psychological impact of isolation, and 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 now what's the advocacy and the push for. Um, connectedness. So a lot of the work has also looked at what does it mean for children who are lonely and isolated, neglected, abused, and what happens to them at a very young age. And so a lot of the work and context for, for, for me has been in South Africa when we look at vulnerable children. If we have a child population up to the age of 18, um, of um, around 18 million, 11 million of those children are living in vulnerable uh, a context uh, on the child support grant, living in, in situations where they are exposed to crime, violence, neglect. And so what does it mean for a society um, when we have to build our well-being? How do we build a sense of self-worth for our children and for us as a whole, um, as a community? So that's been part of the reflection. And systemically, our work has also been looking at, so what are the, the policies, the processes, the support um, the research that's out there and what is missing. And this image is work that we did with our Department of Social Development that, that's in essence responsible for children um, as a government. And then also, of course, there are intertwined layers of uh, uh, um, the system that supports children, education, health and, and others, and supporting youth and, and families and older people and looking at so what is being provided and what is missing and a lot of the programming and integration of of efforts had had 
a lot of the psychosocial support out outcomes and principles missing. So we advocated to build more of that intentionally into programming. So when we are working in communities, when we are addressing social justice issues, it's not just about financial redress. A lot of it is about healing, addressing the trauma um, that people have experienced and that creates a deeper sense of belonging. So how do you build safety and trust? How do you uh, enhance a sense of identity and belonging? How do you allow people to feel loved? And, and what's the, the intentional structure that, that comes with that and where people feel socially connected and have a sense of self-worth? Um, when we started uh, quite a bit of this work was also at the height of HIV AIDS where a lot of children lost their parents, a lot of communities were feeling hopeless. Um, children were heading households, children were infected with HIV AIDS and across uh, families and adults as well. And, and quite a bit of the focus was on adults and not enough on children. So it's how do you address it for, for communities and families as a whole? And so to ensure not only to provide safety and or the kind of safety, physical safety and shelter, housing, uh, nutrition through food, uh, food uh, support programs, access to health. It's not perfect, but there is some access and access to education, once again, not perfect, but also ensure that as you provide those services, you also provide um, the psychosocial uh, elements of it. So um, what we also did through this process, there was a lot of effort towards addressing these material needs of, ch of children, but what we did working across the children's sector with different leaders across, uh, so leaders, decision makers, was also advocating for them to go through a journey of understanding both how do we provide quality services for communities and what does that look like? And it comes back to um, the, the, the notions that Towers also advocates for in terms of collaboration and dialogic practices. What are the conversations that need to happen? Deepen those conversations to see understanding and perspective and through that, uh, take ownership and co-create the solutions that we want to see. So within the notions of belonging, um, as Kim Samuel also speaks about the four Ps. And the, these dimensions of belonging are around uh, as a people belonging to each other. So our relationships with one another and within the context of South Africa and Africa, really the notion of Ubuntu, I am because you are. And so how does that land and find place within us and find space within us? Um, because I am because you are in our, our relationships. And once again, place uh, with, um, with the notion of place, our relationship to nature, the land we live on, our built environment, the spaces that we are in, and how do we intentionally design spaces that builds a sense of belonging and connectedness. Um, more and more how um, our housing infrastructure is, our spaces for play, our spaces for coming together. We, we've we become very isolated even in designing an infrastructure and how does that intentionally shift to redressing um, uh, aspects of belonging where people can easily come together intergenerationally, diverse races, class, age and and share space and 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 see each other in interacting ways that allows them to to build relationships um the notion of power is around our agency and a big element of empowerment as well um and the ability to make choices in in shaping our circumstances but also those who have more power how do they allow for shaping space allowing space at the table allowing voice, authentic voice at the table. It's the notion of the dance floor, that inclusion um, is um, being at the party, but part of inclusion should also be choosing the music and being on the dance floor with others and dancing and flowing in different ways. Um, so how do we um, collectively do the dance um, and how do we envision a future where we all feel our sense of inner power, but also um, 
our outer power and our sense of empowerment of, of those who are voiceless. And then purpose is really, we did a lot of research around um, our purpose and where we come from with purpose and our sense of need. So our purpose and need is intertwined. I need to feel I have a purpose and I can, can, can contribute in the world. And also I am needed in the world so I can fulfill that purpose because I'm needed in the world as a mother, as a friend, as a sister, as a as as part of a community and what does that look like so these four p's have really built on uh, uh um the the different elements and they are um there are additions to what can also be shaped into um these uh dimensions of belonging i'm going to stop there and just check if there are any questions so that i can also just take a sip of water any questions or thoughts or insights at this um, stage um, before I carry on? <clears throat> I don't have questions yet. I just love the focus on belonging and how you broke it down. So I think your metaphor was beautiful and really appreciate it. So thank you. You're muted, Marlene. Oh, I was saying, Shakri, I saw you put your camera on, so I was wondering if you have a question or anyone else, please, any insights or thoughts or questions? I guess my question always is, um, what's disrupting these things? I think that's kind of the natural way that human beings used to interact and live and support one another. and. What do you feel is disrupting things in this time? Do you want to shape that into a question for all of us to uh, ponder, Emily? And if someone wants to respond to that at, at this point? I guess for all of us in our own communities, what's disrupting that sense of belonging? What factors um, can we focus on that we can help build that sense of belonging for children? Um, I have a comment and not really an answer. If I had an answer, you all would be here. But um, um, this is very timely for me because, um, Marlene, I work in um, a healthcare setting um, and just recently have been looking at the um, impact of the macro view versus the local view. Um, more micro view, if you will, um, because a lot of our work in so-called population health is drawn from data that does not reflect the local needs and um, and preferences and cultures. Um, and so um, we're It's like apples and oranges is the best uh, that only comes to mind right now. It's early in the morning here, and I don't drink coffee, so I apologize. Um, but um, the we're trying to apply interventions because that's what medicine and healthcare is always done based on data and metrics that's drawn from large populations that may or may not have anything to do with what we're dealing with locally. And um, so what's disrupting this as in Emily's excellent question, I think is tradition, that's the way it's always been done. And even science and researchers need to catch up with this notion of thinking and act acting and um, intervening locally for efficacy. Okay, now I'll mute myself again. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, thanks, Wendy. It's like you have um, senses sensing into where I was going to go. So, um, oh, um, go ahead, Chakri. Yeah, um, 
So uh, what I mean, I, I was meandering through a couple of other books today, and uh, the other thing that caught my attention was Dixon's book, uh, where he's um, um, exploring the role of peer education in in managing HIV in South Africa, and uh, so it, it it was it was such a pleasant surprise for me to see that book in juxtaposition with uh, the belonging book. Um, and some of the stories also in the early part of the book that really got to me that uh, where uh, Mandela says, you know, even though I was in prison for 27 years, I, I wasn't alone. Uh, he, uh, and that was, that, that really shook me from a, a lot of the conversations I've been having. Uh, you, you mentioned presencing, I mean, presencing institute work there. And um, so one of the things I felt about belonging was uh, to be present for those in my, in my networks. Um, and especially I'm, I'm active with the, with a group of uh, educators in Africa called the Africa Voices Dialogue and they're, they're all over the continent. Um, but as much as uh, they feel good having me around because they say that they, they feel heard and uh, seen, um, but something about uh, that same feeling I wasn't getting it. I mean, I was just I was sharing with my South African uh, therapist friend that maybe I, I'm not seen or heard. The reciprocity is isn't there, and uh, so it's, it's 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 strange when I explore the relational lens, um, the the needs in the relationships are so different. Uh, and that's that, that's uh, what's catching me by surprise um, as I listen to you uh, dive into this as well. Yeah, ab absolutely. So just um, for those who might not have read the book, at the beginning, Kim talks about um, her, I, I call it a light bulb, light bulb moment when she spoke to Mandela and asked him about she was already curious about and trying to understand isolation because her father um got injured was in a coma and um her mother's role as a caregiver and how her father lost his kind of sense of connection relationships because he um he he um he had to go through physiotherapy. He wasn't the same person after he came out of the coma. And so um, how he felt isolated and what he experienced and also his mother as a caregiver. And then the other piece of the story is meeting Mandela and asking him about being in Robben Island in prison for so long, he must have felt very isolated. And he said, no, he, actually he wasn't isolated. He never felt isolated because they were a brotherhood, a brotherhood that focused on the struggle to end apartheid. And so his sense of connection to both um, his higher purpose and that clarity, but also the sense of support and, and love and care that he got not only from his brothers in, in prison with him, but also across the world. And so how our connection to uh, the immediate and the physical, but also our connection to um, the uh, the spiritual, the higher realms also make us feel connected. Um, and what happens when we are lonely and chronically isolated that we um, that creates that disconnect. Um, uh, uh, Chakri also mentions Dixon. So in the book, Kim speaks about Dixon. I've met Dixon. He's a psychologist from Zimbabwe and has been trying to address mental health, the statistics of how many psychologists and therapists there are for millions of people is like so skewed. And so he decided and came up with this idea of the friendship bench where Gorkos old women from the community would sit on this bench and people who need um, uh, just some counseling and support to feel um, a sense of loneliness, isolation, 
sense of depression, anxiety can come to this bench and have conversations with the gawkos. So you either go out there and you sit on the bench and then a gawko sees you and come and these are placed in the communities. And it's an invitation or a request to have conversation. And so those conversations are therapeutic. The gawkos are trained on basic counseling and therapy so that they can support and then do refer referrals for those um, who come along and really feel a need. And then I think it's also the, the the notions of both like Western models of uh, uh, um, therapy and what that looks like and also what are the cultural practices that can help uh, with kind of um, our mental health issues, our sense of connectedness that that makes us feel uh, um, that makes us feel whole and and what is that and 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 there is this what's the global practices that we we, we can learn from and what are we taking from each other so whether it's meditation yoga and 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 how do we hold these practices spirituality that helps us to be resilient and connect to self and and to other so i'll i'll just um carry on and then i'll pause again for us to 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 discuss further and i i i feel one of the big things that we learned as we were reflecting on so what is isolation how do we connect it was also what can we learn from others and how can we create these diverse communities where we create a sense of belonging across different uh, uh, spaces and and a lot of the work and what we learned was it is this it's the local and global and the local and global, and it's also our inner work and our outer work, how we take care of ourselves and what's our sense of rootedness and sense of belonging while we are doing this work in the world. So Chakri, I appreciate your question as well and Wendy around what is it um, at the local and who am I and how am I in this and what what do I give into the world? So, so really it is this inner question and our inner work that, needs to create this clarity for us. So for me, working with communities, it's always been, what am I doing and what is my work and what is my sense of connection? I have two, I have a 21 year old and an 18 year old. And there are moments of guilt where I wonder like, do, have I created that sense of belonging? Um, how do they feel rooted? What's their identities and how do they see it? And just um, to put it out there, my kids are mixed race. And so that's part of the ongoing question in terms of identity. And I always knew that having a sense of belonging for them, wherever they go, they feel they belong, they are part of, instead of questioning, should I belong? Am I part of, am I good enough? Am I whatever color enough to be, be part of um, this community? But it's really around how you create that rootedness for them uh, and expose them um, to this to 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 the inner selves and um what's out there for them so it is a question around our personal how are we rooted and as we were doing this work i have had the gift of working with indigenous people across um the north of south africa the halahadi region and then also in 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 canada and uh, um in the us um, um and and trying to understand also like our spiritual connection. So we did um, work around understanding indigenous knowledge systems and what are those systems and practices that helps us to connect as well. How do we connect and feel that connection and, and what is it um, that some people feel so connected to their ancestors, right? We have in African practices, a lot of rituals to tap into the ancestors, ask for, for help, ask for wisdom when things go well, celebrate with the ancestors and imagine that they are sitting around with us. So what is that that makes us feel so resilient? So whether it's religion or spirituality uh, um, and, uh, and practices that, that helps us connect. And, and what we found was that, um, and then there's a lot of um, theories that are coming out around um, mental health and how spirituality and that sense of connection helps us to be resilient and 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 um, as my colleague from the center of uh, for the study of resilience at the university of pretoria says we resile through our challenges and what is that and what does that look like and what helps us to so what are those um processes or those 
practices that helps us to connect to spirit, um, trance dance or speaking in tongues. So there's a lot of reading around that, but to not ignore spiritual connection. What we also found in South Africa is really at the height of 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 the 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 of of the pandemic um, during COVID, how people found ways whether they could socially distance or not, but found ways to still um, connect to each other. Uh, the programs that we work with, there was a lot of commitment from care workers to continue the work. And also one of the things that we learned was how do we care for the care workers? Because they are at the coal face, they come from the communities um, and, and they chances are that they have experienced or are experiencing um, the, the adversities that the children, that the young people, that the families are experiencing. So how do you take care of them um, when, when, when things are really hard? And, and so, um, what we did was provide a lot of support for those and not so much um, those those typical dimensions, but also the 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 the, the spiritual, the resilient support to and create just spaces for them as they were doing the work, as they figuring it out how to do virtual uh, engagement with children to make sure children are safe, to make sure young people are safe. How do we continue to to take care of. And so there were a lot of moments of loss. And for South Africa, it felt like the loss um, that happened during the height of HIV AIDS, uh, when there was a sense of hopelessness, but there was a deep sense of resilience as well, where people came together, acknowledged the loss and find ways to continue on. So when it comes to belonging and creating communities of belonging and systems of belonging, I think one of the things that we've also learned about, and, and Kim speaks about it in the book, you have to create the foundations. I say with my teenagers, you have to speak to them when things are good so that when things are tough or they get into trouble, they have the sense that they can come to us. And that's the notion of relationships and any relationship that we establish at work um, in our communities as well. So one of the, one of the, uh, projects when we started the work, and there's a lot of work being done around loneliness, um, is the Loneliness Project. Um, this is a UK-based project. It's It was started by the late Jo Cox. Um, she was uh, uh, in, in Parliament, in the UK Parliament, and advocated a lot for um, addressing loneliness and 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 push for this loneliness project to to be established i'm i'm trying to open the link to it um and i'll, I'll share a bit but this uh, project um was really the start of where a deeper understanding um, was created around how do we how how do we advocate for loneliness so this a uh, web page, um, uh, you click on um, an apartment and it tells the story, each person, different age, different context, their stories of loneliness. And part of the question is, when we walk around, how do we feel? How do we feel we belong? as part of communities, as part of societies. And also that when you look at the apartment building, you just about do not know people's situations and how do we show kindness and compassion to each other as we go along. I'm going to pause again and just ask for any thoughts or reflections or insights. Before I, I went for, to the local, I'm going to go a little bit um, global now in terms of what's happening in the world. Uh, quick question about the loneliness project uh, in the UK. Uh, is there a correlation to suicides? Um, that's uh, quite a serious concern there. 
Yeah, so um, the UK has a Ministry of Loneliness that they set up, I think, in 2017, 2018. And it was around this notion that so many people feel a sense of disconnect, this chronic loneliness. They did some studies around the cost of loneliness as well. Uh, there's all kinds of articles. The New York Times quite a few years ago already, but more and more like loneliness being the next public health issue, like um, challenge, right? And and so with the UK, um, when they did the studies, they were looking more at older people, but then also started doing it, uh, looking at other age cohorts, looking at if a, an older person lives by themselves, um, feels lonely, calls the doctor, makes an appointment, is not sick and spends half an hour with the doctor because they are lonely, or um, calls um, some call center and want to have a conversation because they are lonely. So the time of cost, the time of the doctor, the time um, and cost for the, the older person to get um, to um, the place uh, and, 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 and the time spent with the doctor to to get the service. And then the doctor realizing actually the person is not sick, they just want the space to come, come have conversation. So um, when the ministry was, was established, it was really based on this response to it. What they've done since is they continue to measure the levels of loneliness um, through their national lotteries and other programs. They actually provide funding to communities to come up with activities, programs, that addresses loneliness. One of them is um, the big lunch, where as a street or as a block, you can uh, apply for funding to, to do a, book, a big pot lunch, pot, uh, potluck kind of a, a lunch. And so those are some of the initiatives that, um, that, that have come up to address loneliness. Um, with, with in different spaces. Across the world, suicide, the rate of suicide is increasing. South Africa, um, remarkably so. Um, and uh, especially amongst young men, more women as well. And I think across the world, the age is also younger in terms of who, who commits suicide. And when we did the studies looking at adolescents and young people, what we found was that Having peer relationships are so important for young people because if you have a friend or peer, often a little bit older than you, and you have someone that you can talk to about any risky behavior, so whether it's the decision to use drugs, the decision to have sex, to have a boyfriend, to, to drop out of school and all of those, if you have someone that you can talk to and think about, that is important because that person helps you to make the right decision. If you don't have then you make the wrong decision and go into that risky behavior. So one of the part of the programs, um, we call it the buddy system. First of all, who's in your club of life? So if you are at the center, who's in your club of life and how do they help you? Um, and 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 to, to, to ensure that you do have people in your club of life and who are they? And then the other is um, how, who's your buddy and how do you, how do you um, interact with your buddy? And with young people, it's also that you have to build relational skills. It doesn't happen magically. Yes, you can communicate, but you know, have to have relational skills. And so the images that I showed earlier on of the brain of the child, how we support our children, love and care for them, helps not only with the brain development and the physical development, but also with the emotional development. I'm sure there are neuroscience experts in this space who know more about brain development and cognitive development, um, how we show up as leaders as well. So all of that is important in terms of us um, modeling uh, relationships that are meaningful and also relationships that help us not as only as we grow, but how we hold adult relationships with our partners, how we hold relationships in the workplace, how we interact with communities as well. So relational skills and capacity um, when we work with care workers, um, I do a lot of leadership transformation work. All my processes involve relationship building. 
um, whether it's core agreements in terms of how we interact and have conversation, whether it is agreements around how we ask for help or how we manage conflict. Um, I use, uh, it's called safe conversations, which is um, if, if, uh, if we have therapists, it's like using imago therapy to help people have conversations. Um, uh, to 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 appreciate each other to address conflict so there's processes um to be used to to help people relate and 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 engage with each other in the most meaningful way um my favorite is using appreciative inquiry that allows for conversations from a strengths based um place um instead of um from a deficit <coughs> yes Chakri. Yeah, no, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on how storytelling uh, enhances belonging, because I think something about seeing and being heard, um, and so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to it. Yeah, I'm wondering if um, I see if could in story arc, but if someone else wants to. We use a lot of circles of care and support. I feel like sometimes it's no different than the AA model of coming together and sharing stories and asking support and getting the support you need. Um, but um, for, 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 for me, especially when we deal with diversity, equity and inclusion and intercultural stories, we use uh, appreciative inquiry where people can tell stories of their best self and even in the most complex space, what has worked. So really strength-based stories. Um, so for Marlene, for example, as a black woman who might have experienced racism, instead of, um, and, and some kind of in, exclusion, instead of focusing on those deficit stories, speaking about the moments when I, or in the times where I have been included, where I have been seen for my whole self and my ability, where Alex reach, reaches out and asks me, Marlene, do you want to host this? Like those are part of the gifts of sh feeling that you can show up as your whole self um, and what's and all and feeling supported. So it's it's more those um, those processes that I feel is helpful. When, when, uh, when I work, in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion in South Africa, especially, it's easy for us to go into our tensions and, and have our backs up and tell stories of injustice. The invitation is to look at how do we tell stories of what has worked, where is transformation happening, what's the work that people are doing as individuals and as, uh, as the collective to change the systems and to transform the country. So, so for me, that that matters and that's the kind of storytelling that I feel we need more of in, in the world. So I don't know if, if anyone else wants to share. Um, yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, Emily. Yeah, go ahead. Was somebody else speaking? Sorry. Uh, in our program, I work at Cal State. We run a national program in trauma-informed schools, and we use reflective supervision. So similar, but I like the idea of integrating ref, um, appreciative inquiry into that model. But we build teams of caregivers and educators to come together to listen to each other in a structured way. So, yeah, I've learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. What we've also found is that when teams and care, care workers come together in that way to share what their child, I'll give an example. In one of the communities where we work, our schools um, have, have banned corporal punishment. Some of the principals still do it, right? In this community, the care workers would go one by one to him and challenge him and say, you're not supposed to hit the children because the children would come home and tell their gurus and the care workers that they've been beaten and sometimes quite badly. And he wouldn't do anything about it. He kept doing it. And then the care workers as a collective um, come together and share some of their stories, but we've encouraged them to, to focus more deeply on the things that really bother them. And at one point, one of the ladies shared that actually she's frustrated with this principle. He doesn't, he doesn't, he continues to beat the children. And so 
they started talking about it because other children have shared with the care workers and as a collective, they went to confront him. So sometimes there's there's the gift of mass, um, uh, gift of numbers, going to him and confronting him as a collective voice. And that's one of the things that we advocate for. What's the collective voice and how can you show up as a collective voice to advocate? And, and, and so what are the outcomes? We try and also look at what are the outcomes for the children who now are not afraid to go to school class every day who improve their education because they improve their education and feel safe in the school they perform better and because they perform better they can excel through the education system if they are not listened to and 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 there's no um, uh, alternate response what happens is they drop out of school they become very scared they they become dysfunctional right so it's really looking at it as a whole to try and address um some of um what's what's happening and what can be very frustrated and and disheartening and disabling for 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 um for our systems that we work in right um and and so how can we do it as a collective and and she, so i'm just going to i have a few more slides and and th this is really about so what next and what do we continue to do so as a community we've over the past I think since 2014 have come together either every year, work with McGill, look, looked at how do you support the whole student. So have worked in these different contexts of building belonging at, at McGill. I come in as a first year student. I am just a student number. We are gazillions in a in a class and I'm not even seen and I have to deal. We have a lot of first generation students coming into the university and many of them drop out. And so what's the support? How do, how do tertiary institutions provide a space for belonging? One of the models that I enjoy is uh, Vancouver Island University, especially for indigenous uh, uh, students who come into the university and how they support them, how they continue to, to make it feel a safe space in a space where they come in as uh, um, students. There's this notions of belonging for people. Um, uh, we work with Special Olympics um, with, with, with um, all kinds of, uh, initiatives around the rights for older people as well and how do you advocate for these different uh, uh, um, communities, populations uh, to build systems of belonging. So we have a, a global network and also there's a lot of, so the Surgeon General um, in the US, I, the, you know, he advocates, uh, uh, Dr. Murthy, I think his surname is, advocates for building connectedness. There's a report that came out by Sapiens Lab around the state of mental health in South Africa, in terms of our level of tension and our mental well-being, we are one of the worst uh, countries in the world, actually, um, and especially apparently Joh Johannesburg, where I live and love. Um, the, uh, the Surgeon General in the U.S. has also uh, advocated for belonging in the workplace and what does that look like, right? And these uh, frameworks for guiding building belonging. Um, uh, uh, for some people, there's a reason why they don't want to go back to the workplace and, and what, what is that? Um, so there's different advocacies or spaces of advocacy for, for belonging. One of the ones that I've just joined is this global um, Global Initiative on Loneliness and Connection. And they are really advocating for how do we build um, belonging across spheres. And, and, and what the World Health Organization and the UN are looking at a commission on building connection and commission on social connection. The other that I'll also just mention is that around social prescribing, um, there's a lot of, I'll stop sharing now, there's a lot of advocacy for social prescribing that that says that, uh, Wendy linked to your question earlier, um, not everything needs to be fixed with medication. And how do we advocate for, for young people, for older people to be part of communities and meetups and spaces where they can feel a sense of belonging instead of um, uh, uh, um, spiraling into this uh, chronic loneliness that just uh, leads to depression and mental health issues 
and the costs thereof, and how do we create communities of care for each other? So I'm going to stop there. Um, and um, yeah, thank you. Any questions or insights again? Thoughts? I was looking to buy your book, new book on Amazon, but I didn't see it. So how do we buy your book, Marlon? Um, so this book, this is Kim Samuel's book. Um, I think you, okay. yeah, you can buy it. So the stories in it is is really about the programs that I've spoken about that um, um, we've been part of and 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 now building into this kind of, I, I guess, a global movement around building belonging. The book that I I also wrote um, on, as a as a collective of women wrote and that Tower supported was around appreciative inquiry and its questions uh, thriving women thriving world and 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 that you can also get uh, it's a very practical book and it's an invitation to dialogue um, so if you if you want to look at that as well thank you Emma any any questions or thoughts or insight yes Rima. Yeah, so I have a question, you know, for the group, in case anyone might also have resources on this, I'd very much appreciate it. Um, so I've actually recently been contemplating possibly doing a doctorate study, and, and I wanted my interest to be around the topic of um, social connection, belonging, like what can individuals do to build a sense of community especially in a city that constantly changes like mine. I'm in Dubai, in United Arab Emirates, and it's majority expat population. And I work here as a counseling psychologist. So loneliness and isolation is a big deal here um, with both the expat and the citizen community. But I find especially with the expats, it can be quite difficult when they're living away from family, when there's a very competitive culture and mindset about things but anyway as I was looking for doctor programs I noticed the lack of um, people who are actually studying this you know belonging and isolation I found a bunch of organizations uh, and I'd appreciate looking back at the list uh, I just saw in, in the slide uh, and I was trying to reach out to them for any opportunities to get involved or you know could I because I have no research background and I want to gain research before back, uh, experience before I do a doctorate and I want to do it in this topic, you know, but nobody's really responding <laughs> to me and I want to see what ways I can get involved and continue building my interests, you know, in, in this uh, topic because it's very much needed and not many people are really involved in this. Uh, I, I can yeah. Go ahead, sorry Emily go ahead yeah I would say I would I also looked for that uh I run a something called a center for social resilience and I went to UC Berkeley to help validate a tool we were building on social resilience and they said what are you measuring and I said well like collective well-being how people work together and like how your network supports you and they're like they didn't um seemed to find that was a valid construct. They thought, you know, you have to create an, an educational psycho psychological assessment tool that's based on depression or anxiety, you know, something that's individual. And um, they they found that I didn't have like a valid construct. So I think it is a very new thing to how do you measure that belongingness? How do you measure that how we're connected to others rather than an individual pathology? So. Um, I have a... Uh um, actually, it's been some years ago. I wanted to do my doctorate through the Cal program, but I couldn't because, long story. Anyway, had to be. I had to use something that was accredited in the United States because I was getting some assistance from my work. So I went to um. There's um an osteopathic medical school called A capital A, capital C, capital C, um, and then still medical school, and they also have health leadership and so on, and it was great because I was able to, um, they do an applied dissertation. Um, so you can 
have more wiggle room, I should say. And um, because what I wanted to do was look at the electronic health record. This was before it became as quite as um, um, you know, ever present. And um, uh, how it impacted the doctor patient relationship. Um, well, you know, um, and I wanted to do things that hadn't been done before. So I got tremendous support from them to do that and actually completed dissertation that then became um, a pilot and spurred some further research with some academic partners based on that. So it, it was circuitous, but it got me where I needed to go. Um, and um, they have two sites, one's in uh, Missouri and one's in, um, in Arizona. But um, you can do a good portion. You can do most of it um, virtually um, and still get tremendous guidance and support. So I found that very satisfactory. Although I did miss working with Ken and, and other people that I really enjoy and admire. But um, anyway, got me where I want to go. Thanks. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, everyone. I just pasted in and I, I invite you to. So, Alex, if you have the link of the, the work that Wendy's talking about, um, because there's a way to share, save the chat and then you can access the links <clears throat> um, that, that everyone has posted. Um, yeah. So, Emily, I've posted also the University of Pretoria Center for the Study of Resilience. They do a lot. When we started, we used Oxford's Poverty and Human Development Initiatives um, measures, indicators to measure the, the levels of connectedness and well-being um, of our care workers when we started the program and how they progress for the care workers, the children, um, as well as the, the community members um, and, and, and the leaders as well. So there's the building of tools. But also around belonging, Rima, um, a colleague of mine, Saida, she's in the UK and she um, heads the Center for Belonging and Understanding. I pasted that link as well. That might help. Yeah, thank you so much. So we're already at uh, the end of our hour together. So Marlene, are there any last few words that you want to offer in closing? You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> I just pasted also the, because there's a lot of in on, on the link for on belong, there's a lot of articles and the, the pieces of the books as well. I think for me personally, this month is Heritage Day in South Africa. So I'm wearing my Zulu beads. Uh, I was supposed to say that right at the beginning, but really finding um, what helps me to feel my sense of belonging as a mother, as a wife, as a friend, as a sister, and, 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 and my inner work. So my invitation to everyone is let's find those spaces and communities where we can um, find compassion for ourselves and for each other. Um, and so thank you for joining. Thank you, Alex, for this as well. I don't know if there's any closing comments. I'm mindful of the time. Yeah, so, so thank you so much for hosting this conversation, very important conversation today, and really appreciate your work in the world and, and sharing all of these resources uh, today. So feel free to save the chat. Um, we will also post the recording in the Taos Institute Commons, the online community, and that's free and open to all. So feel free to invite others. And, and then there's a comment section so you can continue to share resources or, or continue the conversation and reaching out to each other through the comments. So um, with this, I'm, I'm going to wish everyone a good evening, good day, wherever you are. And thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you soon, hopefully. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. And please email me and keep me updated on your work. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Shakri. Bye, everyone.
Thanks, Marlene. Thank you very much.